Welcome to section 6.8c. All right, gentle people, what we're going to talk about in this video is we're going to talk about Le Chatelier's principle. Now, Le Chatelier's principle is based off this idea that everything goes to equilibrium. So what he says is that if I have a system at equilibrium and I apply some stress to it, the system is going to go ahead and do whatever it can to return to equilibrium. So what that means is if you act upon something that's in equilibrium, the system is going to counteract that effect that you applied to get back to equilibrium. So let's go ahead and think about this equation right here. So the first thing I want to do is I want to go ahead and write an equilibrium expression. So in this case, I'm going to go with KP. So KP is going to equal the pressure of my products raised to their stoichiometric coefficients divided by the pressure of the reactants raised to its stoichiometric coefficients. So let's go ahead and think about what's going to happen with this quiz question. So go ahead and mark an answer using what I just wrote and see if you can figure out what's going to happen. All right, so let's go ahead and see what it first says. It says that I'm going to remove SO2. So as soon as you act upon a system in equilibrium, you should write QP because you've changed something and you got to see if you went ahead and knocked something out of equilibrium. So I'm going to write the same expression. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and try to annotate what happened here. So in this case, I removed SO2 gas. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write this as an arrow going down. So I decrease something in my numerator. So if I decrease something in my numerator, well, that means my QP is going to get smaller. Now, if it was at equilibrium and I made it smaller, that means that QP is now less than KP. And so if that's the case, I know from my last lecture that I'm going to have to make more products and I'm going to have to shift my reaction to the right. Now, I showed you how to think of it mathematically. Another way you can look at this is through concepts. So what you did is you had something at equilibrium, you removed some SO2, and because you removed some SO2, I want to alleviate that stress and make more SO2. So if I make more SO2, I alleviate or counteract what you just did to the system at equilibrium. So that's another way that you guys can think about this. Let's go ahead and try another quiz question and try to do this one without math and just think about the concept behind it. Let's say I add O2 to the system at equilibrium. So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm upping the concentration of O2, which is on my product side. So I'm making too much O2 to get rid of that too much O2. What I can do is I can shift and consume it and make more reactant. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to the left. So let's go ahead and say I have this system at equilibrium and I add HCl to this solution. What's gonna happen? So in this case, I'm adding HCl. So let's write down what happens with HCl. So HCl is a strong electrolyte and when I put the aqueous sign by it, what's What's going to happen is I'm going to make H plus and Cl minus, and both of these are aqueous. What you'll notice, what I'm really adding is H plus and Cl minus, but we don't see any H plus or Cl minus in this reaction. So you might first think, well, I'm not changing anything in my equilibrium, so maybe it just stays in equilibrium. I want you guys to be careful. Can H plus or Cl minus react with anything in my equilibrium? Hopefully what you guys will see is that this is a reaction that takes place. When I have H plus that is aqueous, it can combine with OH minus that is aqueous and makes H2O liquid. So remember what's happening here. When it does this reaction, I am removing these two ions. These are becoming liquids, and so this is my net ionic equation. And so, in essence, when I add HCl to the solution, I am removing my OH-. If I'm removing OH-, 
That means the system wants to remake what it lost, and so it has to go ahead and make more product. So it's going to shift to the right. So let's do another one with a little bit of a nuance to it. And in this case, I'm going to have this equilibrium. In this case, I'm going to change the temperature. So we talked about this in 6.8a. See if you can use Le Chatelier's principle to explain what we talked about with endo and exothermic reactions. What I want you guys to think about is that heat is just another chemical. It can be on the reactant side, it can be on the product side, and it's going to behave just like any other chemical in this chemical equation. So in this case, if I'm increasing the heat, that means there's too much heat in this equilibrium. Well, to get rid of that heat, I can go ahead and move my reaction to the other side to make product. Now, if I go ahead and make product, what you'll see is my products were brown, my reactants were colorless, and so if I'm shifting to my brown products, I'm going to get a darker brown as I increase my temperature. So if you guys want Le Chatelier's principle in terms of endo and exothermic reactions, things that we discussed in 6.8a, here's a slide. You guys can download it and try to go ahead and follow this slide, but we've already talked about this. And so I want to move on. Let's go ahead and continue our discussion on Le Chatelier's principle. And let's see what the effect of volume is going to be on an equilibrium. What I want you guys to remember is that volume and pressure are related to each other through the ideal gas law. So what I want you guys to remember is that pressure and volume are indirectly related. When one goes up, the other goes down. So let's take a look at this equilibrium. So again, I'm going to write my KP expression, and I'm also going to write down my QP expression. So let's go ahead and see what happens here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this thing at equilibrium, and I'm going to go ahead and reduce the volume. Now, if I reduce the volume, what you guys can see is what is going to happen to the pressure. Reducing the volume is going to increase the pressure. So instead of rewriting that QP, I'm going to just use arrows. So what I see is that I have SO2, and I'm going to increase the SO2 pressure. But you'll note that there is a squared term on there. So to denote that, I'm going to say I'm going to increase the pressure, but I'm going to put two up arrows because I am increasing it and squaring it. Now, I also increase the pressure of oxygen because it's in that same container, so its pressure is going to increase, and so I'm going to draw another arrow up on top. Now, SO2, I'm going to also increase its pressure because it's in the same vessel when I reduce that volume, and we see a squared term, so again, I'm going to go ahead and draw two up arrows. Now, what you guys will do is you guys can count the number of arrows. On my numerator, three arrows are going up. On my denominator, two arrows are going up. So what's happening here is the top is increasing faster than the bottom. So if the top is increasing faster than the bottom, that means that QP is getting bigger. And so if it's getting bigger, that means I have to make more reactants, so I want to shift my reaction to the left-hand side. Now, there's another way that you guys can think of it, and that is by counting the number of moles. If I look on my product side, I have three moles of gas. On my reactant side, I have two moles of gas. Now, what you will note is that three is more than two, but let's think about what I'm doing here. I'm reducing the volume of my system. So that means I'm squishing on my system. If I'm squishing on my system, do I want to be three things or do I want to be two things? What you'll hopefully see is if I reduce the volume, I want to go to the side with the smaller number of moles. So again, this tells me conceptually that I want to shift to my reactant side. So this is two ways you can do this problem, mathematically and conceptually. 
So let's go ahead and think about this question. I have that same equilibrium, and this time I am going to add a noble gas. Tell me which way does the equilibrium shift? All right, ladies and gentlemen, this one was a bit of a tricky one. So I want you guys to think about this. If I add a noble gas to this container, and I keep volume and temperature constant, does this change the pressure of anything in my system? SO3, SO2, and O2. Now, what you should come to terms with is it does not change the pressure of any of these. Remember that partial pressures are independent of the other gases present. This is what it means to be ideal. If I add a gas to a system, it doesn't change the pressure of any of the other things in that system. So if all these pressures are constant, that means nothing changed. That means QP is going to still equal K, our equilibrium constant. And if that's the case, I am at equilibrium and there is no shift. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's do one more to close out this lecture. So in this case, let's go ahead and have this equilibrium and tell me which direction do I shift the equilibrium. Do this one concept-wise, count the number of moles on each side. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's look at how many moles I have. So on my product side, I have two moles of gas. And on my reactant side, I have two moles of gas. And be sure that when you do this type of problem, you are only counting gaseous molecules. Don't count things that are solid or liquid. Now, if you take a look at this, two and two, neither side is favored. So if I reduce the volume, I don't alleviate any tension by shifting to one side or the other. So this system is gonna experience no shift because it is at equilibrium. All right, Chem1B, I hope that made sense and remember to stay safe.